This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Hi everybody, I'm Dr. David Granite, and welcome to Health Matters. These days in medicine, we have a lot of new technology that's out there, a lot of new toys that doctors are gonna play with. What's the impact of some of those new technologies? What happens to people when they hear about them, learn about them, or get information from them? What happens when people have access to their own medical information? What happens when we get medical information that's available to other people that we don't wanna have it available to? I'm not sure, but we have somebody who is sure. We have an expert with us, Dr. Cinnamon Bloss, welcome. Thank you. Dr. Bloss is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and has been making this your career, studying the impact uh, on, uh, uh, of these technologies on everybody, mm -hmm. uh, from the doctor to the patient to society. Mm -hmm. um, when I was preparing for the show, something was echoing in my head. And it was, just because we can, does that mean we should? Sure. And uh, that was the, the, the thing I, I thought about it. And, and one of the terms that, that came, I came across was consumer genomics. Mm -hmm. well, let's, let's start diving into this. Tell me about what you're studying, and let's use that as a jumping off point. Sure, sure. So um, maybe I could start by telling you a little bit of how I got interested in this area, which I do find fascinating. Um, I actually uh, am a clinical psychologist by training, so that's what I have my PhD in. And I did my dissertation looking at the relationship between a single gene and cognitive uh, functioning in children. And right around that time, it was in sort of the mid to late 2000s, uh, genome-wide association studies were starting to uh, become possible given kind of the emerging technologies. And I thought to myself, very naively, because I had no idea, uh, uh, really, uh, other than you know, kind of what I had read, um, but I thought to myself, why study one gene when you can study the whole genome? And so I embarked on this journey, uh, which has, has taken me to the, to the present day, and uh, where I've spent the last uh, few years of my career is sort of combining elements of kind of clinical psychology, sort of the impacts of um, experiences and information on people with uh, sort of a love of new, new technologies. It turns out that when we give genetic information to people, it's extremely powerful. It really hits them hard. Why is that? Well, you know, I'd actually challenge that, that assumption. Um, you know, if you, if you look at the empirical literature, and, and I've done a number of studies looking at the impact of direct-to-consumer genomics, uh, you know, we, I think there's this feeling in, in sort of society that genetic information is very powerful. Um, but when you actually measure, you know, um, measure someone's, for example, level of anxiety or level of depression, then you know, give them certain types of information, then measure them again, sort of a very controlled study, you actually don't see a lot of change. And I think that could be for a variety of reasons, but it's true um, for you know, uh, risk information for complex diseases, like you would get in a DTC context. Um, and even you know, when you look at the, the literature around uh, the impact of genetic testing for single gene conditions like, for example, Huntington's disease or BRCA testing for breast cancer, you see sort of some, you might see kind of, um, kind of spikes maybe in anxiety and depression right after the information's given, but generally people sort of return to their baseline. And I think a big reason, and this is sort of a, a limitation, I think in the field is that we study people who choose to be tested, right? Uh, so there's a whole population of people out there who don't choose to be tested, and we really don't know about those people. And they don't want to know. I know in, in my own office, and I mentioned to you, I'm a pediatric eye specialist, mm -hmm. that when we give someone genetic information, there's this deterministic feeling about it, that like mm -hmm. I've just told them what mm -hmm. their future is going to be sure. like. Uh, and sometimes we are. We're telling them that their child's going to lose vision, mm -hmm. and it's going to go forward. Um, and I, I watch it hit them really hard, um, but in the end, usually, 
the knowledge turns out to be somewhat comforting in, mm -hmm. in a sense because now they know what's going on sure. and they know what to expect. Mm -hmm. So we can see it clinically what you describe, mm -hmm. but um, it's sometimes hard to get that information the first time you have it. Sure. Uh, and, and so you, you mentioned DTC or direct to consumer. Should genetic information be available directly to people? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a great question and one that's been debated quite a bit. You know, and to kind of get into that a little bit, I would kind of circle back to what you were just saying about how, you know, it's hard to, you know, if we're talking about what are the impacts on people, are they very adverse impacts, right? And you clinically watch those types of impacts. I think my question would be, um, getting at this idea of genetic exceptionalism. So is the genetic information you give your patients somehow fundamentally different than other types of perhaps difficult to hear health information? Um, because I think uh, that's been part of the debate, right? So we, genetic information um, is different in a few ways than other types of health information. One, it's sort of considered unchanging, right? It's immutable, it's part of who we are. Um, another thing is that we share that information, right? So my genome is actually, I share half of it with my son. Um, and so I think for those reasons, you know, we do have this feeling in society about genetic, you know, genetic information is somehow special. Uh, I, every mother I've ever dealt with would say, did I give this to my child? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's Absolutely. almost the first question. Absolutely. And and dads don't seem to ask that quite as quickly, mm -hmm. but um, it, it's as a parent of three kids myself, you can understand that moment. And then uh, they're worried, like, will it go on and on and on? So I, you do see some of that going on. Mm -hmm. And I guess the concern is, in part, if you do it direct to the consumer, they mm -hmm. don't have someone sitting there talking to them. Right. Right. So how do you mitigate against? You know, here, here's the. Here's the answer, but where's the information? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, I mean, I think that's a, that's so kind of getting a, a little bit of the backstory around direct to consumer genomic testing. Um, a, a small number of companies sort of came on the scene right around 2007, 2008, um, and they were using the findings from genome wide association studies to actually um, test individuals and give them their risk estimates for. Um, both complex diseases like diabetes, like cardiovascular disease, but also you know other sorts of things like um, you know a, a trait fun get considered sort of fun traits like eye color, you know how we respond to lights, do we sneeze, you know right. that sort of thing. Um, so it's a little bit of the backstory, and I think when they when they came out, a big question was, um, and their critics said. We don't. We shouldn't be giving this to people without a healthcare intermediary. And basically, you get your saliva kit in the mail. You pay your money. You get your kit. You send it back. And then one day, a letter shows you, up. Well, actually, it's an email. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I never and, did it. So yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm sitting. I remember. I recall. Um, you know, several years ago when I signed up, I I was sitting in my office and I got actually got an email at work. You know, and I was like, huh. Should I open this right now? I don't know. <laughs> and here you are, an educated person right. about all of it. Right. Um, and, and so, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think um, I, I tend to to be sort of a person who likes to know what the data show, right? So, you know, we can have knee-jerk reactions to things, we can have fear about things, but, you know, is there really, what, what really are the impacts? And so that led me to do actually a number of studies on this particular topic. And, you know, in a nutshell, at the end of the day, what we found is that for the vast majority of people, you know, there's really no kind of detrimental effect of the information, and there's also no great benefit of the information either. You know, I mean, a lot of the proponents of DTC testing thought, wow, this is gonna be great, people are gonna learn about their genetic risk for cardiovascular disease, it's gonna lead them to modify their diet and increase their exercise and so on and so forth. But it turns out there's Not actually so very <laughs> difficult things to encourage people to work on, you know, and it didn't make a difference there either. When I was reading about this again, it struck me that there was some parallel to somehow uh, religious information that the mm. that that um, priests, rabbis, whoever were the keepers of the information and and the communications from God. It had to go through them versus mm -hmm. having people allowed to get directly mm -hmm. to. It. I mean, mm -hmm. are we as the doctor supposed to be the keepers of the information and the, and and through jargon and other you know mechanisms we we hold it and we only dole out what we think is important. Right, and, right. and you start to say, wait, who are we to say that? Right, right. Uh, so from an ethical standpoint, people seems like they might be entitled to this information. Right, right. Right, I mean, you could see arguments on, on both sides of it. Um, you know, I sort of think that if, if somebody wants their genetic information, you know, at a at kind of the most basic level, 
they should be able to get it. Um, Based upon what you've done, can, have you come up with a way that you think is a, is a better way to deliver the information or get it to people that would, um, that would be more impactful in the, in the way that you might want it and less impactful in the negative ways? Is there a way that you would design, given all the knowledge that you have about this, right. that would make the system work better? Right. So people have been interested in, you know, I mean, you know, for many, many years, um, behavioral fields have have tried to think through how can we help people, you know, make positive changes to their lifestyle. And a number of those same groups now are doing research to try to figure out how can they augment their existing interventions with genetic information. And I think, you know, many of those studies are ongoing. As far as I know, there hasn't been any sort of magic bullet um, method, but you know, I think considering genetic information as one piece of health information that's part of a larger picture, um, you know, I think in most cases it's good to have more information. Uh, so that I would be a proponent of that, I suppose. Are, are, do people have to be concerned about privacy issues? Uh, well, I mean, so so that brings us to a different issue, right? So we've been talking a lot about direct-to-consumer genomics, but now that, um, as you mentioned at the beginning of the show, there's a lot of emerging biomedical technologies out there, right? Um, we have direct-to-consumer genomics. A number of people are even undergoing sequence, uh, genome sequencing for different conditions. People can attach little devices to their phone and get their number of steps, you know, or even read their ECG. And so it's, I think in some ways, it's led, uh, you know, people in the field to start talking about, well, let's stop thinking about specific biomedical innovations and start thinking about the information that's generated and how we should deal with that information. And a big issue is, is certainly privacy. And, and so if you do a direct-to-consumer genetic kit, who finds out about those results? Right, so, so good question. So um, when you sign up for, uh, and, and you know, I think, um, Probably uh, it's it's a little bit dynamic at this point, given the companies are startup companies and they're having these ongoing um, sort of skirmishes with the FDA. But in general, you're subject to whatever kind of terms and conditions you sign, you know, when you sign up for this service. And so 23andMe is a big, it's kind of the, the remaining big player in this space. In fact, just this week, they announced um, uh, a set of new new type of health information that they're going to be giving to their consumers. And so, you know, they certainly have access to it. When you sign up, you also give them permission to potentially share or sell the information uh, if you want to. Um, they've had deals with, with large kind of drug development companies. They also use the information for research as well. So in theory, uh, it could be an advantage to you because your name is then identified by somebody who might be doing a research project that mm -hmm. could help you but they would never have found you otherwise and now they might connect with you or something along those lines where they can sell this information and, and go back and forth. What about to um, insurance companies? Yeah, so, so people are very concerned about um, discrimination, right? So we have the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, which uh, I think is a, is a really important kind of first step in protecting people against genetic uh, discrimination. But it doesn't, you know, I think most what is people- it? Well, it basically um, protects people against discrimination in certain areas. So, so it says that if, if uh, testing shows that you have a problem, the insurance company can't deny you, change your rate, do something? Well, it depends on the type of insurance. So um, long-term care insurance, for example, life insurance are things that are not covered under GINA. And it's actually not only um, genetic information that you might get via like a DTC service either. It's also you know, family history information, you know, any type of sort of genetic information. But I think most people at this point argue it just hasn't gone far enough. And especially given kind of the, the emerging kind of onslaught of uh, available genetic information, we need to take it further. Um, we need to expand the existing legislation. You know, you said something that's really important. I think there's an onslaught of mm -hmm. genetic information. It, it, it's, it exceeds what we're able to absorb right now. Uh, even as physicians, we're getting sure. information. I, I don't know if I could go to medical school now because every disease has a, a locus that we have a genetic correlate to, and I don't think I could memorize all of those. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so the computer adjuvants are gonna be hugely available, but this explosion, physicians don't know what to do with, mm -hmm. as well as, as the general population. Mm -hmm. um, so, so as a society, 
how do we, where do we go with this? How do we do this in a smart way mm -hmm. um, that, that the impact is smart and people get it and we educate people? How, how do we, how do we build that? Yeah, so I, th I think there's a lot of, I, I'm, I'm encouraged, there, there, there are a lot of complexities, but I also think there's a lot of um, great people working on these issues. So um, there are a number of initiatives to um, integrate genomic education into medical school curriculum. That's been sort of emerging slowly but surely over the past few years. Um, there are also people out there that that are actually doing work on you know what's known as genetic literacy or you know so sort of health literacy you know and then genetic literacy and people actually doing that kind of public health research. So, so I'm encouraged by both of those things. I do think though that um, you know as far as kind of streamlining patients' access to their own information is gonna be sort of a, a, an, an important challenge over the next couple of years because uh, I think we're challenged by, um, you know, what some call the paternalism of the healthcare system, the difficulty um, storing the, that type of information in the medical record, the difficulty of patients being able to access their own medical records. Um, lots of controversy, lots of technical issues. I think those are going to be big challenges. One of the things I've been I've been dying to ask you when we start to realize that you're going to be on the show is um, I had um, uh, Rob Knight on. He is um, a fabulous guy working on the microbiome, sure. and, and what he's doing is revolutionizing health. But he has this project called American Gut, yes. which is enormous, but it's crowdsourced and funded. It is. Mm -hmm. and, and I just was wondering what you thought about that, that science being done in a crowdsourced, crowdfunded mechanism, sure. and, and you know, where, where, citizen science projects. What, yeah. what, do we, what about those? I think it's fascinating, and I think, um, and I'm a, I'm a big fan of Rob's work, and uh, I hope to collaborate with him in the future. I think everybody here UC San Diego is yeah. waiting to collaborate right, with him. Right, right. And, and he's not the only one with crowdfunded project, right? I mean, in many ways, 23andMe, the company we were just talking about, I mean, they're crowdfunding their own research, right? Um, but I think, you know, th that is a controversial approach to science. Um, many people f find there are ethical issues with that, that, um, you know, the risks some say about patients being exploited, you know, kind of expecting something for their money and then potentially not getting it, um, you know, not knowing kind of what their expectations are. But, you know, I think at the same time, there's an argument to be made that, pe that it, it will help people become more engaged in the science and more, you know, literate too about the, the questions and perhaps empower them to be able to ask those questions. I mean, there are, um, you know, other projects out there where actual participants can propose research questions and some that can even allow uh, participants with the infrastructure to actually do those studies, which I think is, it's great to get the public interested it's in science. It's kind of cool. Yeah. You know, and, and in some ways, the NIH is, is crowdfunding. I mean, I mean, it's our taxes. It's taxpayer money, but, you know, absolutely. They're crowdfunding it. Right. And then, then you add the paternalism of where the experts, we know where that money should go, mm -hmm. versus the crowd deciding where it should go. Absolutely. Um, and it becomes, I, I, that's when I started to look at this differently when I thought of the NIH's crowdfunding mm -hmm. with paternalistic mechanisms in place, mm -hmm. which are great and, and, and have value, but maybe there's something to be said for this other way mm -hmm. uh, of approaching it. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I, from uh, all sorts of approaches, ethical, and, mm -hmm. and where, do, where does that go? It's, it's sort of a fascinating hashtag first world problem. I don't know, but it's, sure. it, 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 I mean, it, it, it's, it's an interesting new mechanism for all of this. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know that um, years ago, uh, my dad was diagnosed with uh, a very rare form of cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and I put together a listserv and I found a way to, I, I was calling doctors all over the country and passing that information along. So we got patients mm -hmm. with the same diagnosis together. Now that's common now, mm -hmm. but we were able to raise money and do things and talk right. to each other. And, and through the force of, of the crowd literally mm -hmm. get information that was uh, uh, not available, and we had mm -hmm. 100 blood samples of a rare disease that we could get. Um, and so that, I think that people taking control of their own health care is a real positive mm -hmm. in the way they live their life. Absolutely. Um, and so, how do we do a better job at getting doctors to agree to that? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good question. I, you know, I, I, I feel for um, healthcare providers, you know, like you said, um, I think when we were talking earlier, they are very challenged by the time pressures of their jobs and very little time to spend with patients. Um, they're in a system that's kind of more or less been in place for many years. Um, it, it, so I think it, it, you know, it is a challenge. And, and going back to the direct to consumer piece, you know, I have a very um, dear friend and colleague who's a genetic counselor, and you know, she and I discuss these issues. And I say I think it's great that 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 people have access to their own genome. And and she says, yeah, perhaps that's true for most people, but the one percent that has struggles with it end up in my office, and you know, and I'm kind of f faced with with dealing with that. Right. And so um, you know, I think it's a tough problem. I think. For physicians and other healthcare providers, the incentives have to align appropriately, as with most things in life, right? You get what you incentivize. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, kind of, I think, um, you know, creative approaches to maybe redesigning parts of the system is, is what's eventually going to need to happen. Um, whether that will actually happen in the near term is, I don't know. <laughs> so, you, your, your research. And, and the future of where we're going with all of this. Mm -hmm. um, take us through what, what, what the, the next five years and then the next 50 years. Wow, the next 50 years. Yeah. Uh, so I'll take you to the next five years because that's a little bit easier to imagine at this point. Um, so in the next uh, few years, I actually am just now starting uh, a project that was recently funded by the National Institutes of Health um, to basically look at uh, individual conceptions of privacy. And so, uh, to, you know, privacy is an interesting concept because it's been around for a very long time, you know, but dating back to the late 1800s when uh, privacy, it's interesting, privacy first became embodied in our laws, largely in reaction to inventions like the newspaper um, and photography. So things that sort of challenged individual privacy, right? And so now we're at a point where, you know, there's a lot of quote unquote big data, um, you know, Science Magazine, you know, earlier this year had on their cover, is this the end of privacy? And so we're dealing with a whole new set of inventions and what is our new sort of conception of privacy? And so um, I'll be spending the next few years um, hopefully providing some insights on that topic. Yeah, it's fascinating a world where we live our life online and, 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 and for many people mm -hmm. and we're taking pictures of everything that we do and, and right. uh, w what is privacy anymore? Right, I mean our phone, you know, uh, I, you know I'm, I'm sort of a little bit concerned that you know, Google knows where I am all the time, but yes. I'm not going to turn off the GPS because I, I really like the convenience of you know, knowing how to get to the studio. <laughs> yeah. and, and Cal IT2, where you're doing some work, mm -hmm. they have all these devices that, that are going to transmit to your mm -hmm. phone and tell you what your heart rate is, what your blood sugar is, and what your health uh, measures are. Sure. And if that's in your phone, then it's not just in your phone. Mm -hmm. Um, and and our, our, our whole world is going to be like that. Uh, and it's only getting more and more that way until one day we'll be plugged in and online. So 50 years from now, science fiction. You know, it's hard to say. And part of the reason I like being in the field of emerging biomedical technologies is because by definition it's cutting edge. And so it's, so it's you kind of don't know, I think, to some extent what's coming next. Um, you know, going back to the idea of kind of citizen science, um, Part of me wonders whether much of science may be citizen science in the future. Uh, you know, we're in a we're in a point where there's kind of diminishing um, budgets, you know, federal budgets for research dollars, but yet, um, you know, by some accounts, an increased interest in science on the part of the people who it might be able to help which to me suggests kind of a, a, a scenario where, you know, that we may really see an upsurge in, in kind of these citizen science projects. And it's fascinating because it's at the same time as um, educational studies are showing a decreased science literacy. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, uh, we have people interested in all this. There's some magical thinking. There's decreased in scientific literacy. Um, and yet we're gonna, we may shift some of the burden or how this gets done. Mm -hmm. It, it's, it's fascinating to me. Uh, I, people come into my office all the time who um, think things work one way and they don't, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and where, where the science is. And of course, scientists are wrong all the time. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> and, we, and we, you know, we have 50 years later, we go, oh, they didn't know what they were doing 50 years right. ago. It's just the best we have at sure. the moment. Um, uh, one of our guests uh, in a previous show said um, the difference between scientists and non scientists are scientists are very clear on how little we know. Mm. 
-hmm. and, and I thought that was, that was beautiful because that's why we keep studying all of this. Mm -hmm. um, what's your next big project after this, the one with the NIH? Not that that's big enough on, <laughs> on privacy. Um, well, I hope actually uh, we, we've just been working on sort of developing a project for l looking at actually the impact of personal microbiome information. So, uh, you know, this is a, a new type of information um, that people can basically access through crowdfunded studies like Rob's. Uh, they get information back that compares, you know, the bacteria in their gut or whatever part of their body they sampled um, to other people in the study, to, to other people in other projects. And so, you know, one question is why do people seek out that information? Is it because they have an illness they think it could help? Is it just out of you know, curiosity, kind of the do-it-yourselfers? Um, uh, also, I think a, an important question, as with DTC Genomics, is do they share that information with their doctor? And if so, what does their doctor do with right. it? Right, yeah. exactly. And so, and a lot of physicians have no idea what to do with that right now. Exactly. Uh, yes. So it, it's up in the air. That's why everybody here wants to work with Rob Knight. And w since we've had him on the show, um, I just haven't gotten around to it yet. But I'm absolutely planning to be participating in American Gut because mm -hmm. I think it's cool, yeah, sure. and I want to know. And so I, I get it. And and what do I do with that information? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but mm -hmm. um, but I can tell you that most physicians I speak to have no idea what to do with that information, mm -hmm. and yet patients will come to them with it. Sure, Say, look, sure. look what I got back. And, Absolutely. Uh, and and so, you can imagine that would create kind of a frustrating exchange on both sides of the table, right? Oh, you know? Yes. Um, and so as we hope as part of this project, if we get funded, um, that we'll actually be studying not only people who seek out the information, so participants in American Gut, but also the physicians they share the information with. I think this is fabulous. I'm so glad that you're out there doing this because, you know, day to day in the trenches delivering medical care, we're not thinking about what you're, what you're looking at, but it's crucial to understand what, what the impact of, of all this is and, and how it should be delivered, et cetera. I, I think it's, it's wonderful, and um, I'm going to be looking for guidance, uh, as all of us will be in medicine. What, what do we do with this? You know, now what uh, sort of moment? Um, and I feel like I should go back to that, that opening sentence, just because we can, does that mean we should? Sure, sure. Yeah, an important question in ethics. Yes. Um, you know, sort of the, the um, what do we do versus what ought we do, right? Yeah. And, um, I don't know if I'm supposed to be the one making that decision. <laughs> right. And I don't know who should. Right. Uh, so it, it's fascinating because at least you're bringing data to the table. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, I think that informed decision making is crucial in all of this. So thank you so much for spending some time with us thank talking you. about this. Uh, I hope everyone was listening carefully. Uh, here on Health Matters, we say it over and over again that knowledge is power. And it's an interesting thing because this is consumer knowledge. And what do you do with it and where do you follow up with it? I hope that uh, here on Health Matters that the information we're giving you is helping you all the time to interpret what you're going through in your own life. I'm Dr. David Granite and we we'll look forward to seeing you again next time right here on Health Matters.